Welcome to Beverly Unitarian Church. My name is Pat Hoffman. I am a worship associate, and I am so glad to welcome you to worship today. We are a Unitarian Universalist congregation of children, youths, and adults of many races, religions, secular identities, genders, sexual orientations, abilities, educations, incomes, and traditions. Here we celebrate a diversity of beliefs, striving always to make space for more. All of you is sacred. You are welcome here. Whatever your past or present is like, we invite you to walk into the future with us. Like other Unitarian Universalist congregations, we affirm seven principles, which are not doctrine or dogma, but rather our shared values and moral guide. To learn more about these principles, please visit the website of our denomination, www.uua.org. Our minister is the Reverend David Schwartz. Today, however, I will be speaking as a member in the pulpit. I'd like to welcome also our musician today, Maria Moser. We especially welcome visitors and hope you'll stay for the virtual coffee hour after the service on Zoom using the link that will be shared at the end of the service. We look forward to the day when we will be able to meet you in person. Due to the coronavirus, we are forced to distance ourselves physically, but we can stay connected. To get more involved, please check out our Facebook page and our website. Contact the office to sign up for our monthly newsletter and weekly Friday email blast and to be connected to Reverend David for pastoral care. And now, let us join together in spirit and prepare our hearts and minds for worship. blessing of the hands in a time of pandemic. Many hospital chaplains offer a blessing of the hands for those who work there. This ritual and blessing by Reverend Linda Susan V. Ulrich is intended to honor that blessing in a way that maintains safe distances. So please join me in the hand motions while I share this blessing. Bless these hands that hold the health of those who come through our doors. Bless these hands that shelter and protect the vulnerable among us. Bless these hands working to stop the spread of fear as well as illness. Bless these hands that mirror the love and compassion within each of your hearts. Bless these hands that shimmer with wonder at the way life flows through our bodies. Bless these hands that connect with others no matter what the distance. And bless these hands that you may stay safe as you labor on behalf of the entire community. The leaf unfurling in the April land, the newborn child, the loving parents can. These constant, common miracles we Full pain, a part of human misery. 
you ever played the game where one person starts a story and then each person in the game adds to the story when it's their turn? The story I'm going to tell you may be as much as 2,000 years old. I've heard a few slightly different variations and it doesn't really have an ending. So I'd love to hear how you would tell the story and how you would continue the story after I finish. Once there was a farmer in a small village. The farmer was very poor, but he was blessed with a family, a wife and a son, and he had a horse. The farmer prized his wife as his love and partner in life, but the farmer was getting on in years, and he found that above all else he was most grateful now for his son, because his son was strong, and without the son the farmer could not work his land and chop his wood and make a living, meager as it was. And what the farmer valued second was his horse, because without his horse, even he and his son together could not plow the fields and bring in his crops. So without his son and his horse, surely the farmer and his wife could not survive. One day, the son ran into the house to say the horse had run away. <gasps> oh no, cried the wife, this is terrible. This is the worst news ever. The farmer sat still for a moment then said, maybe yes, maybe no. Who knows what is good or bad? Well, the wife threw up her hands, rushed out of the room, and flung herself onto the bed, sobbing in despair. The next morning, however, the wife opened the curtains to see the horse returned, bringing with him a strong mare to be his mate. <gasps> oh! Joy! What a miracle, said the wife. We are saved. This could not be better news. But again, the farmer said, maybe yes, maybe no. Who knows what is good or bad? Ah, said the wife, and off she ran to celebrate the happy news, and she didn't come back until late at night, tired and tipsy from celebrating. The next day, the farmer's son went out to tame the new mare so that she could be used to help in the fields because she was a wild horse. As he was attempting to ride her, she suddenly bucked and threw him to the ground, breaking his leg. Oh, <gasps> horrors, said the wife as she ran to help her son home and splinted and bandaged his leg. Now we really are lost. How can we survive without our son's strength and ability to work the fields and manage the horses? This is, right, the worst news ever. And what did the farmer say? I bet you know by now. Maybe yes, maybe no. Who knows what is good or bad? One more day later, the wife, still hiding under the covers in despair, was awakened by the thunder of horses' hooves. Up to their door came the military, seeking to conscript or require all able-bodied young men to fight in the war. Guess who did not have to go? Because he had a broken leg. By now I'm sure you know what the wife said, and I'm sure you know what the farmer said in reply. Maybe yes, Maybe no. Who knows what is good or bad? And that's as far as this story goes. So now it's your turn. Can you keep the story going? And if you were in this story, who would you be? The farmer or the wife? Now is the time in our service where we share the joys and sorrows of our week, that in sharing, our joys may be magnified and our sorrows lessened.
was graduation month. Thousands of students finished up months or years of hard work to a graduation unlike any other ever. Instead of marching down the aisle, many have been marching in protest. They are stressed about uncertain future education, work, and income. They're disillusioned about our political system, our legal system, our prison system, immigration system, health care system. They are facing a deeply divided populace and dysfunctional government. They're worried about our environment. They're scared of our global pandemic. They are bored, overwhelmed, inspired, and unmotivated, just like the rest of us. And they are isolated from their friends, extended family, mentors, and even mental health professionals. And yet they've achieved so much and deserved applause and recognition and a graduation speech. So, congratulations, graduates. We love you. We are proud of you. And you have truly earned the great gift of 2020, failure. I know, probably not the gift you were hoping for, but perhaps not such a bad gift after all, at least as defined by Pema Chodron, the American Buddhist teacher and nun. In 2014, Pema Chodron gave the commencement speech at her niece's high school graduation. Her choice of topic as she looked out at a sea of hopeful, eager faces was fail. Fail again. Fail better. Children was actually quoting Samuel Beckett. Ever tried, ever failed, no matter. Try again. Fail again. Fail better. So why was this a great message to give the graduates back in the pre-Trump, pre-pandemic era? And why is it still a great message for our graduates and all of us today? Because life is not like school. School is ordered. Life is messy. Perhaps never more than this year. And while school offers lots of help on how to succeed, there are precious few lessons on how to fail, how to change, and how to grow in a world that is not stable and unchanging in which the lessons do not always build one upon the other in a well-ordered and logical way. In school, right, the area of a circle is always pi r squared. In life, pies are often messy and sometimes end up on our faces. <laughs> life teaches us that our textbooks, grades, and our carefully prepared note cards are really of limited value in the chaotic and unpredictable real world. So yes, grads, you have succeeded. But now, as your congratulation balloons are slowly deflating, it's time to commit ourselves to going forward into the unknown, into our unstable and chaotic world without the false security of study guides and note cards, feeling that despite all of our preparation, we are still ultimately unprepared fearing we will get it wrong as often or more often than we get it right. And that is okay. Because we are as prepared as we can be, and now it will be something other than order and stability that will move us forward. I like to think of it this way. Life is not a bowl of cherries. Life is a bowl of frogs. We can put our frogs in the bowl, but as soon as we get a few of our frogs in the bowl, of course, what do they do? They all jump out and we have to start again. No amount of training or expertise on our part will keep them in the bowl. And yet, that's just what school suggests is possible if we just study, learn, and prepare hard enough, right? And that's what many of us spend our lives trying to achieve long after school is behind us, that relentless striving for order, for control, for success. But that attempt is ultimately doomed to failure time and time again throughout life. So in a sense, graduates, school has failed you. And you will fail and fail again and hopefully fail better for the rest of your lives. Real life is full of failure. But 
before you get really depressed, let me offer another gift. Perhaps new definitions of success and failure. Success is having things work out the way we want them to. So, therefore, ergo, failing is just things not working out the way we wanted them to. And maybe we will have more success in life if we shift our goals from controlling our frogs to playing what is called the infinite game. The infinite game is a game that is not played to win, but the game that's played to be played. Every move in the infinite game is designed to help our partners to keep the game moving. In the infinite game, failure is part of success, and both are essential elements in keeping the game going. Ever tried? Ever failed? No matter. Try again. Fail again. Fail better. Now Chodron says, we all know that the mire and muck is just outside our door waiting to get us stuck. There are so many frogs we cannot keep in our bowls, and nobody likes chaos and failure. If we can accept that failure is as much a part of the infinite game as success, then maybe we can avoid getting stuck in the mire of anger, avoidance, overwhelm, despair of failure. The window to Cakewalk Chicago around the corner from my house caught my eye the other day with a uh, fantastic window decoration depicting this quote. Life isn't about waiting for the storm to pass. It's about learning to dance in the rain. Huh. Time to sign up for dance class, right? Because 2020 is just one storm after another. So I'm trying to dance in the rain, but how can I not feel like a failure? Like our government, our nation is a failure, and we are failures for allowing such massive failures. And what can we do anyway in the face of such a mess? What should we do? Pema's unconventional advice to fail, fail again, fail better, is really a call to not give up or give in, not to rely on old note cards, but to study and rely on something much deeper to guide you. Your feelings and your openness to your own vulnerability and inevitable failure. Can we open ourselves to acceptance and even curiosity of failure? Can we feel, explore, and learn from the deep discomfort of chaos? And in doing so, can we ultimately welcome the unwelcome? This new learning is so different than most school learning, isn't it? And it is at once so simple in theory and so difficult in practice. We are called to sit with our feelings, overwhelming feelings, angry feelings, ugly feelings, feelings of failure, whatever feelings come up when things are not working out as we want them to. And then we are called to take responsibility for what is happening in us to us, to hold that rawness of vulnerability until we see where that leads us. That is our road to welcoming the unwelcome. James Joyce wrote how failure can lead to discovery, or in his words, mistakes can be the portals of discovery. Can we imagine then that even though failure and chaos never feels good, it is actually hard to tell in the moment what is a failure and what is actually something shifting our life in a whole new direction. Is this a failure or a shift? And when things shift, we really don't know what will happen or where we will be when the dust settles, which leaves the door open to the possibility that there might even be blessings hidden in the horrors and failures and chaos and mess. Nature already knows this. Forest fires ravage the forest, 
and then the ash fertilizes new growth. Seeds must crack open in darkness and explode in order to send out roots in search for water and sprouts to send up new growth. Caterpillars don't just go into their cocoons, slap on wings, and fly away. It is hard, vulnerable, and full of loss, no doubt about it. I mean, how many seeds fall on rocky ground? How many magnificent old trees are lost in the fire? Caterpillars actually have to completely dissolve into a disgusting pile of goo within their cocoon in order to transform completely into butterflies. So, the story goes, if you're a mess right now, wrapped up in blankets, that's okay. But keep going. You may not be failing. You may be transforming. Your failure may be, in fact, a shift. In fact, we decide what is a success or a failure, right? We decide. Is any outside event that impacts our lives innately good or bad? Maybe yes, maybe no. Remember the farmer? Who knows what's good and what's bad? In fact, like the yin-yang symbol shows, maybe there's always some good in the bad and some bad in the good if we are open to see it. From the place of vulnerability, acceptance, and even welcome, when we aren't masking ourselves or trying to make circumstances go away, we become able to find the hidden blessings in even the unwelcome events of our lives. The alternative, all too often, is feeling stuck on a nightmare roller coaster like the farmer's wife, right? Always chasing the highs and running from the lows. We may anesthetize ourselves in all sorts of ways to avoid that raw pain of vulnerability. Quarantinis are a joke, right? But at some point, not a joke at all, but a painkiller, all too easy to abuse. Another risk is aggression, blame, anger, and violence at others. Lots of ugly things that we may be feeling right now in ourselves and that we are seeing in both our neighbors and some of our so-called leaders and protectors. And yet, if we can sit with our feelings and observe them with curiosity instead of blame, out of that very same place of vulnerability, we become able to stop blaming ourselves or others, and our best qualities begin to shine. Real, genuine communication and connection can happen. We find in ourselves bravery, kindness, the ability to really care about each other, to reach out, and to help one another. And we see that we can dance in the storm. And instead of seeking success, that we want instead to play the ultimate game. Welcoming the unwelcome and finding hidden blessings starts in each of our personal lives as a spiritual practice, but from that very personal space, these practices inform the way we deal with the world at large and can lead to large transformational change. I'm sure you've heard the Margaret Mead quote, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world, Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. Well, it's not easy, but there are people who inspire us and guide us and show us the path. And sometimes they're unlikely guides, but they are in themselves hidden blessings if we are open to seeing and hearing them. I'll give you just a few examples, but I'm sure you have more yourselves if you think about it. So take Daniel Hill senior pastor at River City Community Church right here in Chicago. I'd never heard of him until this week when somebody posted a Facebook link to an article about his work and his 2017 book, Quite Awake. And I read something that most of us, I bet, never learned in school and that would be valuable to sit with in vulnerability. That white has a culture. 
And in fact, the United States has a normalization of whiteness, meaning that every culture in America is expected to conform to normative notions as established by white people. Yet, even if we say we want to fight for change, white normative culture always demands an action plan, says Hill. Wow. I don't know about you, but when I sat with this one, it sure rang true for me. An action plan. How do I fix this problem so we can get back to something that feels normal? Hill calls this influence triumphalism, the search for success. And there's that word again, right? Success. So Hill says when an unresolved societal problem surfaces, it poses a threat and it must be fixed so that we can feel a sense of achievement. I want to pass the test, graduate, make my frog sit still in my bowl. But instead, echoing Pema Chodron's advice to sit with the discomfort and feel the feelings first, he'll encourage us, us to start our journey with lament. Lament, he says, doesn't function according to the rules of success. It sees suffering not as a problem to be solved, but as a condition to be mourned. Lament is not the destination, but it is the way to begin processing pain and suffering in the world. Lament gives us resources to sit in the tension of suffering and pain without going to the place of shame and self-hate. In the language of theology, lament is a guttural cry and a longing for God's intervention. A lament is truly seeking to comprehend the heart of God. So to be clear, a lament is not grumbling or despair. Grumbling and despair are accusations, complaints, shutting down. Lament involves the energy to search for truth. It is passion to ask rather than to rant and rave with already reached conclusions. A lament uses the language of pain, anger, and confusion, and moves toward God. Or, I might say, towards playing the infinite game. I sure don't remember learning any of that in school. And it is a big shift in thinking. Another, perhaps unexpected or unlikely guide for me, is Dave Chappelle, a stand-up comedian who is edgy and provocative, sure, but a spiritual guide. And yet, more than once, he's shown us how to lament and then even how to find hidden blessings in the unwelcome. In 2018, for example, in the middle of a typically provocative comedy monologue, he unexpectedly shared his very personal anger at the racist vigilante murder of Emmett Till the 14-year-old black boy accused of whistling at a white woman, and the horrifying admission of his accuser years later on her deathbed that her accusation which led to his death had been a lie. That alone was a huge, valuable lament. But then, in a surprise move, Chappelle spoke of taking a step back to see the bigger picture of how this murder and this horrific lie helped to galvanize the civil rights movement, which he said, quote, set in motion a sequence of events that made my wonderful life possible. How could this be that this lie could make the world a better place? It's maddening. And that's how I feel about this president, he said. I feel like this president might be the lie that saves us all. So Chappelle shows us that even in the face of the worst feelings of horror, anger, and failure, if we can sit with our feelings, our lament, we can seek and hopefully find a hidden blessing. Could this lead to a shift? We have lies that need to be lamented, and shifts that need to be made. And we have an election coming up. So, like Chappelle, I would say, sit with your feelings. Don't run away from them. Feel them. 
observe them with curiosity, and then don't wait for the storm to end. Work now, and then vote for the future that you want to help create. And what about the pandemic? How could there be any hidden blessings in the pandemic, right? Like the Great Plague, thousands have suffered, thousands have died, and we have no cure in end or end in sight. And yet, in the midst of this horror, one of the most influential activists in the United States, Angela Davis, whose work around issues of gender, race, class, and prisons has influenced social movements for generations, was somehow able to sit with this pain and fear and failure, as well as the murder of George Floyd in the midst of the pandemic and the violence and rioting afterwards. And just as our kids were graduating into this world full of failure, she spoke to us all when she said, this is an extraordinary moment. I have never experienced anything like the conditions we are currently experiencing the conjuncture created by the COVID-19 pandemic and the recognition of the systemic racism that has been rendered visible under these conditions because of the disproportionate deaths in Black and Latinx communities. And which also gave us the opportunity to collectively witness one of the most brutal examples of state violence. But, she says, I've often said one never knows when conditions may give rise to a conjuncture such as the current one that rapidly shifts popular consciousness and suddenly allows us to move in the direction of radical change. What a powerful message from a woman who has worked and sat with failure tirelessly for decades in her fight for social justice. So. It's a chaotic, messy, even violent time we're in, and it really is uncomfortable. But change never happens easily. And maybe this time we are in a shift if we can welcome the unwelcome pain and struggle to get there. Frederick Douglass's words back in 1857 still ring truer than true. If there is no struggle, there is no progress. Those who profess to favor freedom and yet depreciate agitation are men who want crops without plowing up the ground. We want rain without thunder and lightning. They want the ocean without the awful roar of its many waters. This struggle may be a moral one, or it may be a physical one, or it may be both moral and physical, but it must be a struggle. It's hard to welcome the struggle, but we can do it. We can lament. We can explore our feelings and shift from seeking success to playing the infinite game. 2020 has so far been rife with very unwelcome chaos, loss, and crises, but there have also been blessings, personal blessings like births, weddings, graduations, new jobs, new careers, new learning, and big blessings of opportunities to unify and galvanize for positive change systemically, nationally, globally. Can we, like that farmer over 2,000 years ago, welcome whatever comes our way without judgment and try to hold the fullness of life in our hearts? Ultimately, we are united in our feelings. This is what human beings have felt from the beginning of time. This commonality of feeling, of failures, of good times and bad times, and not knowing where any of it will ultimately lead, unites us. Together, we can keep dancing through the storms. We can dig up the earth in order to plant new crops. We can commit ourselves to playing the infinite game, but only if we're willing to welcome the unwelcome and open ourselves to fail, fail again, and hopefully fail better on our personal and global roads into the unknowable future. May we all say, I am willing. I am 
morning and I am willing for to be hopeless would seem so strange it dishonors those who go before us so lift me up to the light of change there is hurting in my family, there is sorrow in my town. There is panic all across the nation, and there is willing the whole world around. But I am open, and I am willing to be hopeless, would be so strange. It dishonors those who come before us, so lift me up to the light of change. May the children see more clearly, may the elders be more wise, may the winds of change caress us, even though often hard, the path is never clear, and the stakes are very high. Take courage, for deep down there is another truth. You are not alone.